my company creates the most digestible business content on the planet. And the way that we do that is through short videos. So imagine reading the Wall Street Journal, imagine reading Forbes, imagine listening to How I Built This by Guy Raz, imagine listening to Andrew Ross Sorkin on CNBC. Those are media formats of the past, whether it's linear TV, documentaries, magazines, books, but that's where the world's best business content has always lived. And the business, business content has always been for the intellectual. And there've always been kind of some high walls surrounding business content in terms of accessibility and for, I guess, entertainment value. And what our future aims to do is merge business education with entertainment in a way where millions and millions and billions of people can learn about topics in business and be exposed and be inspired to go out and achieve awesome stuff. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Thread. On this episode, we have Michael Sikand. Michael, welcome to the show. What's going on, Calum? It's a pleasure to be here, man. I'm excited to have you on. This is going to be this is going to be a good one. Okay, so just to kick it off, and I want to I want to start with this. Um, the opening lines of one of your tweet threads that I found. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'll ask a follow up question based off that. So this is how you kick it off, and you kick it off with energy, which I love. So I built a six figure business as a content creator in six months, zero to 500,000 cross platform subscribers, zero to 400 million plus views. So I'm just going to give the audience that for now. Can you kind of just give us like an intro into what you do, what you're working on at the moment? Sure. Um, great way to start it off with a little bit of a an anecdote or a bit of evidence, secondary source. Uh, so our future, my company, creates the most digestible business content on the planet. And the way that we do that is through short videos. So imagine reading the Wall Street Journal, imagine reading Forbes, imagine listening to How I Built This by Guy Raz, imagine listening to um, Andrew Ross Sorkin on CNBC. Those are media formats of the past, whether it's linear TV, documentaries, magazines, books, but that's where the world's best business content has always lived. And the business business content has always been for the intellectual. Um, and there've always been kind of some high walls surrounding business content uh, in terms of accessibility and for, I guess, entertainment value. And what our future aims to do is merge business education with entertainment in a way where millions and millions and billions of people can learn about topics in business of being exposed and be inspired to go out and achieve awesome stuff. And uh, we're really opening up the pathways to new audiences and really reinventing the way that business content uh, is delivered by making it super short, um, you know, really peppy, uh, very entertaining, high paced, high energy. So that goes back to, to the high energy. It's in everything that we do. We have around 800,000 combined subscribers now, so we've grown a bit since that tweet. And we do you know, tens of millions of monthly views on our own content. I am a host, we have another creator under the brand. Um, so we create original video content where we you know, produce business news and business stories for Gen Z um, on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Snapchat, you name it. And then we also have a division where we create the world's most digestible business content for other companies. Uh, for example, My First Million, which is a, an excellent podcast that some people may have heard. Damn, that is sick. I, lo I, I love what you're building. And it's interesting because I've been following you on Instagram for a little while and seeing your reels. And like the production is like off the charts, first off. And then the second thing is, is you're really relevant. Like it's like the second I see a business topic on Twitter or on CNBC that's big and people are interested in few minutes later, the video is there, the breakdown, the kind of summary of what's happening. Um, it's very impressive. I think one thing that I'm curious to understand, and even when you were explaining what you did, you gave the context of like the guy Raz, which is from NPR, right? Or like Andrew Ross Sorkin, who's on CNBC. These are like institutions of like financial news and business. I'm curious... How, how do you see yourself? Like, what is the end goal? Because even the fact that you put it out there, it's kind of a bit more than just like, oh, we're putting out like cool content on Instagram. It's almost, is that kind of what you're aspiring to, to almost be like an institution in kind of like the financial media space? 
Yeah, I think institution has some negative connotations, the word itself, right? Like Gen Z inherently hates institutions. Like Mm -hmm. they hate big brands and they actually tend to follow people. And that's why we've seen the creator economy blossom because anybody can pick up their phone and talk about, you know, Kim Kardashian's new private equity company and have a relevant take that makes sense and that millions of people can see like all in the span of 24 hours. The thing about our future is I do want to go for that institution. I would maybe call it a brand instead. I want to create a source of knowledge. I want to create uh, a trusted source of information with really high quality content and just go a little bit beyond that, you know, pick up the phone and record. Like you said, we have high production value. I personally have always put the brand first. Our future, I would love to become a household name for how young people learn about business content and to be their version of CNBC or Morning Brew or uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, And I've made quite the effort to detach my own personal brand from our bigger brand. So there's a few reasons for that. One, you know, uh, we're building, you know, we want to build something that doesn't require me being in front of the camera forever. So, you know, having an exit strategy is key as a content creator. And second, um, you know, to, to build something that, yeah, can stand the test of time and uh, be a source of information no matter who's in my seat. So we're leaning towards becoming a media brand, maybe like the bar stool of business um, in that way. Lots of creators under one brand that makes people think that, oh, that they're all part of our future, right? They're part of this yeah. bigger brand that we now buy into. I love it. You know, you know what? When you're and, – and the thing I like about, I, I like about it it comes across so clearly when you speak like this is really it's really well thought out and even when you watch your content we spoke about the production value and i remember reading this thing i think alex homozi said it which is when you see a content creator or a business or a brand that does something and it seems seamless and it seems very high quality a ton of reps practice trying things, failing, having things not work, having to pivot, have gone into that process so that they can give you that piece of content that looks seamless and has that production value. I'm curious and I want to get deeper into like, how did you get to this point? Because now it's like the vision seems clear and the content is of a certain quality, but like, where did you even start with this whole thing, this whole content creation journey? Well, I couldn't agree more with the, the, what Alex said, right? Like whether it's the orange in the grocery store or it's the video or movie that you watch, we tend to take what we consume for granted. So that's why I think this longer form, these conversations, candid conversations with creators and entrepreneurs are so valuable for people who want to build things uh, because they just bring realism to the idea of going and starting your own thing. But the thing that I started, uh, well, what I started our future when COVID hit. Uh, I was sent home from school. Uh, my internship got canceled, uh, kind of fell through, and I was really looking to take advantage of the crisis that we were seeing. You know, we may have been locked in our homes, but the internet was going to be the place to stake your flag, right? It was a huge opportunity for me. I really wanted to stand out and do something. And I had thought about doing a podcast before, but I didn't actually go out and do it until I had that moment in time where I'm like, wow, I'm at home. Like, There's really successful people who are on their computers and going to be more available for interviews. And it's also like a lot of my peers had their internships canceled. So I was like, how can I create a source of knowledge and how can I curate career advice for them? Um, You know, if young people aren't as excited about business anymore, like we're all just at home and no one's taking us seriously because internships are getting cut left and right. So the goal was to build the best source of business content for young people. Uh, but the medium was the podcast and I ended up going on a 150 interview tear, um, over the course of a little over a year and really, really fell in love with media because I had always had business ideas in high school, but I wasn't actually able to execute because I never knew how to code. All my ideas were like an app to like guide you through a grocery store or like a study app or some homework app or something. Right. And, uh, it's hard to build products. And it's hard to build good media as well. But for me, I've always been savvy with content, the written word, speaking, presentations. 
So media was just this very natural place for me to live and to apply my life force to. And um, yeah, really took it and ran with it and uh, discovered TikTok about halfway through my podcasting journey and realized just how valuable it was and just how explosive it was becoming with my generation and my target audience. And uh, I really uh, started to see why uh, TikTok should be the focus of our content uh, as opposed to just being a back burner place where we throw clips now and then. So yeah, the podcast was extremely influential and I kind of wish I'd been on TikTok from the start, but you have to cut your teeth somehow and you got to start somewhere. And it made me develop such an incredible network that I assume that is happening with your show. So really a fantastic, sturdy stepping stone. Yeah, no, that's, that's so good. And I love, uh, I love just the pivot of obviously COVID was terrible in people's lives for so many different reasons from like the health side of things to how it changed people's plans, like their schooling, their careers, whatever. But, and I think I've seen this trend with people that are successful, which is they're able to turn things that almost seem like L's or seem like bad situations. They turn it to an advantage. And you could hear it even when you were speaking. It was like, all of these people um, are at home. They have more time to, people have more time to jump on interviews and be guests on, in, on podcasts. People also have more time to listen to podcasts. And it's like, your mindset instantly saw the opportunity, which I think a lot of people kind of saw it the reverse way, which is like all the stuff that was to their detriment. So like kudos to you for that. Thank um, you. I think with the, with the podcast, you mentioned like you wish that you had started with TikTok from the start. Does that mean that you like you wanted to do the podcast, but you wish you'd use TikTok to market it, or that you were just going all in doing short form content from the start. Yeah, I mean, the podcast brought such incredible things to my life, and it allowed me to learn media and content distribution and storytelling. And but yeah, I mean, I do really do wish I got started with TikTok earlier because, um, you know, the the market for attention has gotten way more competitive. Uh, on that platform and across the short form media's that landscape in the past two years. So, but, but then, you know, you have 2020 vision in hindsight. Um, I wouldn't have had access to such incredible people. I wouldn't have learned how to send a good cold email. Like there's so many, there's a huge positive side. Like I met so many influential people through the podcast. Like I had the CMO of Chipotle. I had the CFO of Spotify. I had the founder of Grubhub, Spikeball, Kayak, Quizlet. I had so many Netflix, I had so many big names and they, they've really created a, a wonderful network. So, you know, you, everyone wishes they invested in Facebook and, you know, 2012 or whatever it was, right. Mm. Or Apple. Yeah. You know, what's interesting as well, because I think it's, it's also, you have to take like such a long term view to everything, which is, and I think for both of us, like we're super early in our career. I know Gary Vee talks about this a lot, where he's like, it's like, I'm 40 or I'm 50 years old and I'm just getting started. I wish people knew that, that they have so much time. Um, so even though you spent, like you put in 150 episodes, which is like, I do a podcast. I think we're on episode 20 now. That is a lot of work to get to 150 episodes. Um, and I'm sure like, to your point, it's all paying dividends now. But I guess I'm just... I'm curious to understand at what point did you make the pivot from doing the podcast to TikTok, short form content, all of that? And what motivated that pivot? Yeah, I think the motivation was just in how many people that I was able to reach with the short videos. So when I started making my first few, you know, and I got my first video to pop, um, you know, my podcasts were deep and they provided a lot of great advice and there was excellent banter and they were really high quality 15 minute interview products that a lot of people enjoyed. You know, 500 people would tune in every episode, loyal people at my doorstep to go and consume that. But I was, I was starry eyed when I saw, 
you know, 1.7 million viewers in the first 24 hours of a video I made about Mark Zuckerberg. Granted, it was kind of a throwaway hit piece talking about how he had done this thing where he only ate uh, 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 animals he hunted himself. And the video was very, very viral, right? And it didn't really like educate people in this deep way about the business world and journalistic fashion that I had spent so much time honing. Uh, but it was really like getting in front of all those eyeballs. And that's where I really saw the opportunity. I'm like, wow, if I can keep doing this, can build a really, really significant business around it. I wasn't able to do the, any, make any money on the podcast just because my viewership was, was low and I didn't really want to do a paywall and all these things. So, I saw a more immediate path to success, fame, and fortune using those platforms. And maybe it was from a place of vanity of like mm -hmm. wanting to be seen by a lot of people and have my work appreciated and be what be on the hot platform and be on TikTok. I think those things were kind of the impetus and the motivation and the views were a huge driving factor behind uh, wanting to put my put the, the content out there. Hmm. The thing is, I like that though, because it's real. Like I think sometimes... When people talk about content creation, they talk about like, it just has to be about the passion and the love, which is true. Like you have to really enjoy it if you're going to do it for long enough. But you also do want some success. Like you want to see some results. Yeah, like you want for to sure. See, you want to see views. Like that's just the yeah. real, that's just the facts. <laughs> like yeah. no one, like no one's recording anything just so no one listens. Like it's, uh, that's not the reality of how it works. Um. And I never I cared so. at first, like I never cared about the views on the podcast. I knew what I was doing and I knew the long journey, but at a certain point, yeah, you do burn out and you do need to build a business. You mm -hmm. can't, but if you're willing to do a podcast for a year for free, you're probably going to end up in content. Like you're just going to, right? Yeah. So a lot of people are probably a little impatient about it, but I think I deserve to, to follow those more, you know, vanity-based metrics given the amount of sweat I'd put into another media format. Yeah. I'm curious because you, you did 150 episodes and this is just interesting for me to hear because I'm on this journey, right? Which is, I remember when I started off, the goal was only to do 10 episodes as like a test. Similar to you, like growing up, I'm, I always had like a bunch of ideas, but I didn't have that execution, that follow through. So mm. I was like, let me just do 10 episodes just to show that I can put something out like publish, just get in that routine. But I loved the 10, up, 10 episodes so much. I was like, okay, I need to go again and again and again. And now you're just in it. I'm curious for you when you break it down, what was it like going from, like how did your mindset shift? I don't know, even after you've done like 50 episodes and then from like episode 50 to 100 and then up to 150, like when did the gears start to turn of like, okay, I'm going to do this like long-term, this content creation? It, for me, it actually happened on day one. There was no alternative that our future would be a household name. From the first day I came up with the idea, I was running on the beach. Um, it was COVID. I had one COVID buddy and we meet up and we go to this beach in California and we, we jog it out and listen to music. That's kind of when the idea was incepted. And I had no doubt in my mind that if I put my life force into this and I was just so, so passionate about it that I knew that there would be no alternative from day one. A lot of people ask me, like, when did you decide to go full time on our future? I'm like, I was full time from the day, from day zero. Mm. I was bought in, truly bought. I was so euphoric about it. And uh, that's when I knew I'd found my calling. Mm. I think, I think a little bit of it was lost in the sauce when I changed formats and I did get burnt out over all this podcast, over all that time. It's impossible not to get burnt out. But I really did find the space I wanted to play in. And um, it's never all, always going to be pure dopamine to the brain when you think about the future of what you're doing and the work you're putting in. But for me, that's how it was from, from the very start. And there was never going to be a world where I didn't turn it into something huge. Hmm. So when you say from day one, was it like... Because the thing is, even listening to you speak, I can tell that you have like a strategic mind. Like you're kind of seeing how the different pieces fit together into a larger overall vision, which I think is one piece of it. Like the strategy makes sense. The second mm. piece is just like the emotion, like the feeling. 
Like I remember, like when I record these podcast episodes, like I'm pumped afterwards. Like I have so much energy and that feeling, it kind of tells me I'm like, oh, I'm in the right place because the feeling you can't, you can't manufacture that. You can't no. build that in your brain. Mm. I'm curious when you say you, when you say you knew from day one, was that the strategy element or was that just the feeling of producing content that was motivating that? It was the feeling of doing something new, innovative, and finally tapping into what I should have been doing all along. Taking advantage of my natural skills and putting it out there for the world to see and standing on that stage and standing in front of all my peers during this wild time and just doing something of my own. Two and a half years later, we're still fucking doing it. <laughs> we're still fucking um, doing it. Yeah, I love it. I love we're it. We're still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> We're still doing it. See, you know what? That shit is crazy liberating. Like when you step into, because it's really a vote of confidence in yourself. Because it's like, I'm going to bet on myself and my strengths. And I'm going to fully lean into that. Especially, I think, at like our age. Because there's, there's like a conventional wisdom of how your career should go. And I think it takes people like longer to be like, I'm actually really good at this shit. So I'm just going to, I'm going to do that. But when you, when you make that decision, you go all in. It's like you're going all in on yourself. That, that shit is validating. Like that is a, that is self-confident, like personified. And you need some, you need some delusion to be successful. I was delusional as hell in my early, early days. You know, I wanted like big media companies to put me on and like, I wanted, you know, I, I, I pitched this podcast like it was the freaking Magna Carta, man. And, uh, <laughs> I think that's what bought me a lot of goodwill with some of these guys that I emailed, you know, and um, I really think just as a young person, you have the license to ask for the moon and to ask people for advice. And if you go about it the right way, you get a lot of, a lot of stuff in return. But yeah, pretty delusional. I would put my clips on like all my personal social media is like, I really shove it down my friends throats. And I think, uh, I think I was a little much for sure. But, you know, I was just so blinded with love and passion for what I was doing. And even when I look back and think of it, it was a bit cringy. I mean, when are you going to not look back on who you were and think it's a bit cringy? Like, mm. everybody thinks back in their past self and is like, what the hell? It's cringy as hell. Yeah. But you just got to accept it. It's raw. It's real. Yeah. Bro, that's exactly what I feel like I'm doing now. I'm, I, I know my friends, especially back home in London, they must be like, he posts about this podcast so damn much. He posts the clips, the tweets, but it's like, I don't know. If this is your shit, like you really put work into it, like you really go above and beyond. You should be like proud to put that, put that out there, like to promote it and have people know about it. Um, I owned it, man. And it seems like you're owning it too. I owned it every 150%. I owned it. And I, t I, I, you know, invariably, inextricably attached me to my podcast and I became the podcast kid and that's who I was. Yeah. Okay. I want to, I want to ask that one guy. Yeah, no, I love it. I want to, I want to ask one more question about the pod and then we'll go over uh, to some of the stuff you're working on now. So you mentioned some of the guests that you managed to get on the pod. Can you just give us like a story? Like, I don't know the craziest story the most audacious moment of like how you got someone to come on the pod that you were like, I can't believe that shit worked, but he's coming on or she's coming on. So I, I, uh, I reached out to this, the, um, CMO of, uh, Chipotle or no, the CEO, I reached out to the CEO of Chipotle. Super simple. Uh, and he saw it and he actually forwarded it to his PR team. Um, and I ended up getting on a call with the gatekeeper, the PR lady. And I remember like dressing up in a suit and like, um, like acting all official and just charming her and like making, you know, telling her this was the go-to business podcast for anybody under the age of 22. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, she gave me. The CMO, I mean, she didn't end up giving me the CEO, but she gave me the CMO of a Fortune 500, you know, she would give me Chipotle. I got to talk to the CMO of Chipotle in my childhood bedroom, you know? 
200 listeners. I got them. Uh, and got to like them to send me all this merch and it was pretty cool. Another one was I accidentally added the chief strategist of this big bank, BMY Mellon. I accidentally added her on LinkedIn and then I was like, yo, I read about you in the Ross magazine. She actually replied to me back on LinkedIn. She's like, that wasn't me because she didn't go to my, my the business school I went to at Michigan. Um, but I was like, oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm still really interested in being my will and would you give me an internship? <laughs> and uh, I just asked that on cold message and she's like, oh, well, you know, I didn't go to Michigan. We probably don't have anything. But then when I reached back out to her three months later with this podcast, she was down to do it. So it's just a good example of really just shooting your shot. And I think older business leaders really value that because they're like, wow, this guy's got some good hotspot. Like he's got yeah. some mojo and you know, he's, he's just an absolute hustler and people love that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's so true. And it's, it's funny because I did an interview with Jack Butcher and he was kind of reflecting on, um, like how he built his agency and companies and all this stuff. And even how he came from the UK to America and we were talking about like the power of audacity, mm. especially when you're young, just like being audacious, like being willing to put it out there that people who especially are older and have achieved things, they really respect it, man. Because I think it's, I think it's what you say. It's just the energy of it. Like they, yeah. they just like your energy. They're like, oh, this guy's gonna, he's gonna do some shit. I don't know what it's gonna be, but it's gonna be something interesting. Um, Can't, yeah, you, I don't know if you, it just, that's the screaming message, right? Of these Gary V's and these business gurus. How many people actually do it? How many people actually are audacious, right? Mm. Very few. Mm. And it's, it's the follow through as well, because yeah. so many, so many people just consume advice and consume yep. information. So if you're one of the people that actually does shit, they're like, you stand out just off that, just off you're taking the successful. action. Yeah. yeah, if you're if you're if you have a bias to action, you're gonna be successful. Yeah. Um, it's funny though that like so many people just consume this self help like motivational entrepreneurship content, but like you gotta find it within yourself. Like you gotta find that thing that you're gonna run on the beach about for like two hours thinking about like this thing you're gonna do for a year for free. Like that's what you need to find, and it's got to come from within. Nobody telling you something is ever going to make you really do something. It's got to be something that you experience personally that's going to drive you to, to action because people need dramatic examples to shake them out of apathy, right? Mm -hmm. They need, right? Not only do they need these people like saying this, but at the end of the day, it's never going to be what they say. It's going to be like their existence, then them fighting within themselves. And then they're like, oh, it aligns, right? Mm -hmm. what these gurus are saying yeah you know what's so interesting i remember seeing a clip from jay-z um and he was at like a conference and he was saying like everyone has a superpower like everyone has an ability or a talent that they could be world class at that they could yeah. be lebron james or jay-z at that thing but i think so often and we all do this right we put certain people on a pedestal and part of that is you're also telling yourself, like, I could never do what, like, LeBron did or Jay-Z did or this successful business person that you look up to. But I think everyone has, like, a talent, which is, it's, like, God-given. Like, it's, like, your mm. thing. And if you totally. committed to that and dedicated yourself to the same level as a Jay-Z, you would be him in that field. But I think it's, it's so much about, like, self-belief and so much goes into it. And luck as well. Like there's so many luck, luck. I mean, I, I got lucky in like stumbling into what I wanted to do. Like I didn't have to work a job during COVID. Like I could just create podcasts in my room. Like everything was paid for. Like I got lucky in that, like the, about the circumstances and the timing and like, it's, it's all, I was born in the U S and it was just, just so much luck that went into all of this. There's, there's identify the, the there's identifying the thing that you're going to be the Jay-Z at, which is another challenge in itself. And that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to truly explore what they want to explore, or they just aren't curious enough, or they're just not in the right place or what have you. But then there's you, then there's identifying that talent, but then you have the talent, but like you got to be in the gym. Like I've been in the gym on this for two and a half years in media and storytelling. Right. 
You can't just copy it and expect to perform. Um, you've got to put in the reps. You've got to be lifting weights to really unlock that talent because talent by itself is pretty flimsy, right? Like only with continued practice and routine and regimen, like does talent like equate to superstardom? You know what I mean? Mm. I love what you said about being in the gym and it reminds me, um, I remember seeing this quote from Tom Brady where he talks about like the man in the arena. Right. Like there's certain people who are in the arena, they're in the game and they might be losing. They might be getting their ass kicked, but they're at least in the game and they're taking, you can't replicate the learnings from being on the field, taking the reps or in Tom Brady's case, taking the snaps and seeing these different looks and then watching the film back. And I think sometimes... And I, I used to do this as well. It's almost like you want a short, you want like a shortcut. You want to short circuit the process and have the clear vision from the start. But the only way you get clarity on the vision is through relentless action over time. And I think those experiences, you start to kind of, you start to see where your unique skill set is. And even with this podcast, like every interview that I do, I get a clearer picture of like, oh, me and the guest, we really resonated on this topic. This is what I should be talking about. Like, this is more of my area. But yeah. if I didn't do the interviews, and the thing is, I'm only 20 into it. What happens when you're hundreds, thousands of interviews in? Then it's like a different, the whole mindset will be different. Um, and yeah, I think what you're saying is so powerful. Like, people need to get in the gym. Like, get in the gym. And it's, um, it's difficult to do, but it's so rewarding once you find your thing. Um, yeah. But anyway, let's uh, let's move it let's move it past the podcast because there's so many interesting things that you've done since. Um, you spoke about like that Mark Zuckerberg video, the one that got 1.7 million views. I'm curious, like, how did that come about? Was that just you you just threw something up and it got that amount of views? Were you like making a bunch of videos and then that one hit? Like, what was even the process of? something like that happening well i think every successful creative stands on the shoulders of of those who created art before them and i think the moniker is like good artists copy like great artists steal i don't know if it's like that something along those lines but i saw a creator that was doing the style that i create videos in for sports and it was so accessible digestible and informative that i knew if it could be applied to business it could be a way larger business opportunity and it could truly be a transformation in the category. There's already so much good sports stuff out there for consumers, but for business, I really saw the untapped opportunity and I wanted to take what he'd built and bring business into it. That was the inspiration. I started trying videos in his style, made a couple of them work. And then Zuckerberg was like, maybe like the fifth or the sixth one that I did in that style, maybe like the seventh or the eighth or the ninth or the 10th. I can't remember, but it was taking a framework that another had pioneered and then putting my own unique spin on it. I think all creators get started by kind of taking another creator style and then working their own paintbrush onto the canvas and really running with it and making a, their own brand out of it. And that's how the content space works. Hmm. So me taking Frank Michael Smith style, uh, and then, yeah, that was like the real first real video that, that worked in that format. And, um, a lot of it is just like storytelling, right? Like it was a really crazy hook. Like the hook was like, Mark Zuckerberg is a confirmed killer. And then like, it was just so positioned for virality. Like the footage I used, like I engineered like the right scenes for movies and the gifs and the right intonation and the right little script that was so tight and didn't lack for any kind of, um, detail and like had exactly what people needed it and it was 30 seconds long and the it was witty and it would like the the hook matched up with the ending and it was really just that formula for mm -hmm. virality that like what you talked about you're like i've improved so much like i think it's hard really hard to look back and like codify in content like how how much better you become but 
I would love to try and create more frameworks like, oh, like this video went viral. I really want to figure out like what were the struc- what was the structure of that that video or like this interview is amazing. Like what truly made that interview better? And then applying that to the future work. Because there's active self-improvement and there's passive self-improvement. Passive self-improvement is like you're in the gym every day and then you just, you know, over the next three or four months, you start to look stronger and better, right? That's how it is for you. That's how it was for me with what I do. But I think being really intentional about looking back and learning is key. And it's still something I haven't tapped into. But I did create that tweet, which you talked to me about earlier, which was kind of like my framework for telling stories. And I think that like the, the Mark Zuckerberg story uh, is a good example of fitting that framework mm-hmm. um, for, for virality. Uh, and storytelling. So, yeah, I think it, I think it matches up to even the spec of today. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 actually curious to go deeper into that with you. Like, I think to a certain degree, like I work in marketing, like brand, like the biggest companies to startups, they're all trying to, like, if they could put the virality, like the magic of the internet, in a bottle, and just be able to bring it out whenever they want. Like, it'd be the most powerful thing in in the world, right? Like, if you could really put a formula to it. But I think, think, and I think to your point, there's like, there's certain things that you can optimize for. Like, maybe the length of the video, the storytelling, the hook, and all this stuff. But there's just a certain magic of like, when you posted that clip online, it was the right moment. And everything just kind of aligned... I'm curious. Do you even agree with that? Or do you think it's I do. I do. I think that was a wonderful segue. I really do. I think that, I think that everybody in this performance driven data analytics world wants to wish there was a framework. I wish there were frameworks so I could create an audience on Twitter telling people how exactly to do what I did. But I've always believed that it's more art than science, but there are things that you can take away from, from reflection looking back in the past. Um, and I'd like to strike a happy medium, but I agree with everything that you say and that, no, you can't replicate social media success. Even these gurus who try and tell you like what to do, like it's still pretty surface level. It's like, you know, post every day. Like there are things that you can do, but Mm. at the end of the day, you got to come up with your own genius or lightning in a bottle, right? To unleash. Mm. And, and, And it's interesting, right? Because a lot of the advice, it's just ways to increase the probability, which yes. is like, it's like the equivalent of like, just shoot like 500 more three pointers and one of them will go in. Like just shoot more, just get more quantity, get more volume. Well, I think that's life. I think that's life, yeah. you know? Yeah. Right? Like it's a volume game with everything yeah. that we do. Like whether it's dating, whether it's business, whether it's asking for interviews, whether it's, you know, seeking out the book that's going to really change your outlook. Like we're constantly spinning that wheel. We're constantly cycling through things to get to the thing that is going to be the most true to us. So I agree with you that content is a really great manifestation of that ideal in life, wherein you're just throwing shit out there and seeing what sticks. My advice is you throw shit out there, you see what sticks. And then once you find what sticks, just try and formulate that as best you can and continue doing that. Um, to where you could have that baseline, right? And then you can build something out of a baseline. You can't build something out of like one-off viral magic. Like Mm -hmm. you do have to have product market fit with your content. And I think you can achieve that by throwing shit around. But once you find that product market fit, like, oh, this went viral. Let me just keep doing this format and this style. But then that doesn't last forever as well. Like the views go down, right? So it's a constant game of like invention, reinvention, manufacturing, like creating process. And then you have to break that schema again and try something new. Hmm. It's a really weird space. Hmm. You know, I want to, I want to get deeper into that with your story. So you have that, you have the Mark Zuckerberg video, you then kind of see, you take that model and you keep repeating it and you're putting out more videos in that mold. When, what was the next level of that? What was the, I don't know, the first brand deal, the first like, where you're like, oh, I just went up another level. Like what, what was that moment? The, I think the, 
the step of going up another level is when I brought on another content creator. Like I brought on, then we had two personalities under the brand and I was able to double our production. And it all, we also seem more of like a legit media company with like not only two different creators under the brand, but two different TikTok properties. And we were really becoming that media brand, that institution that I talked about. So really like differentiating between being some kid that makes videos and building a company with talent that is represented underneath it. So bringing Jackson Kessler on after having met him, after he interviewed me on a podcast like you did uh, a year before we started working together was the magic moment. And having that extra content and legitimacy really helped us position this brand into a place where companies wanted to advertise. Um, you know, it created more advertising inventory. Um, it allowed us to grow faster. So I think that was really like the big next step, like, Rupert Murdoch-esque moment of my journey so far of like, I'm going to think about how do I scale this business versus let me just create making viral videos. Let me think how I can have an exit strategy. Let me think how I can de-risk me like being sick. Mm -hmm. That was the real like business strategy moment. And um, the next big business strategy was like starting our consulting business to, you know, have consistent and stable revenues that are highly scalable as well. So I'd say those were the two big moments. You, you know what's interesting? I've, I've realized this recently. It's a different mindset in some ways, being like a business entrepreneur than just strictly being a content creator. Like yeah, when I- agreed. I, I'll listen to like Mr. Beast talk and stuff and like interviews that he does. And like the level of detail, like that guy is all about the best possible content. Like he will take some a three second clip out of his video and change it around and do all of this work. He's just thinking about the best possible content. Whereas I think as an entrepreneur, as, as like a business mind, it's also about how do things scale? How do I create processes? How do I build more leverage so that even though this one thing might not be perfect, all these other things are better and it leads to a better overall product and business. Um, I'm kind of curious, can you go a bit deeper into, like you said that you met Jackson from a, like a podcast interview. How did that then happen into him joining forces with you? Like you just stayed in contact over the year or like, how did that come about? Well, I, I'm sure we stayed following one another. He interviewed me. He, he gave me the moniker King of the Cold Email because he was really inspired by the guests I had been able to pull in. Yeah. Um, so he did an interview. With, it was actually his first like interview with me. He was like, I could tell he was a cool, quirky kid. But we didn't talk after that interview much. And then I saw him starting to do well on TikTok. And then I saw that he was doing starting to use a similar style to me. And he even DM me, he's like, yo, how do you do your thumbnails like that? And I was like, hmm, if I can use my innate skills as a storyteller and like my innate ability to persuade people like with a good vision, then I can have him join me and we can just build something so much bigger. And um, it really ended up like working out and he's part time with our company. Um, but uh, yeah, the way it's scaled and I, I think even he, beyond his own imagination of where it could go and we're still going and we're still still driving and he's had a lot of transferable skills that he's developed out of the experience, not only in, you know, the, the compensation and joining our company and building it and having a having a stake. But, um, you know, he's started his own car page now and he's grown it to 100,000 followers, I think, on Instagram in two months. So it's like pretty incredible that I got to meet someone like Jackson, uh, who was the perfect guy at the perfect time to help me build this into what I needed it to be. And my, uh, I have my business partner. So Simi, who's our COO and president, I met him off freaking LinkedIn. And it was because I did the podcast that I met him. He was also doing a podcast and reached out to me. Jackson reached out to me because I was doing my podcast. And then our VP of content, Sia, who's our kind of human Swiss army knife on our team also reached out to me because she saw the podcast on Instagram. So again, I guess it's kind of like you, you asked me that question, like, Oh, like, do you wish you had done TikTok earlier? I probably wouldn't have met the high quality, incredible people that work, work on my team now that I wouldn't have any business. I wouldn't have any business without them. So 
it's another example of like, you got to start with something and like, you just got to go and build. And like, even if it's, you're not doing the exact thing that you're going to end up doing, like it's all part of the journey and you're collecting the infinity stones. Like you're, mm-hmm. you're building the network. You're, you know, you're amassing the, you're putting arrows in your quill. Yeah. And then, you know, then, then it's the right moment, right? Then it, you have the, the things. Cause like a lot of it's just building up the resources to be able to capitalize on a moment. Like mm-hmm. I had built the resources and the skills and the people to go then execute on that short form video thing when the opportunity was right. You know, mm-hmm. you just got to be working in the gym. Cause then when you're ready to fight that bear, you know, you can take him down. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. We're going that arm wrestling contest. We're, we're going crazy with the analogies today. There's like there's there's the man <laughs> in the arena. There's the bear. There's the gym. We got everything going down. I um, got to. <laughs> and you know, you know what's so interesting. I was because you you mentioned before, like to be really successful in entrepreneurship, there needs to be a certain level of delusion. And I think the reason that is, there's a period of time when you're just doing things with no real idea of how it will all work out in the end. And when you are doing your podcast, right, you're the guy in the gym. And through that process, you're meeting other people that are also in the gym. And it's like, you're looking at each other and you're like, oh, like we really do this shit as well. And then you can start to find those common threads. But like, if you, if none of you were ever in the gym, it never would have happened. Like that moment where you came together never would have occurred. Um, okay. I want to, I want to move to like the consulting side of the business before, before I actually go there, do you remember the first moment you actually started making money from doing this? Like, and and was that like a crazy light bulb thing or was that just kind of calm? I don't know. It was really exciting. I had my first brand deal and I had no idea how to price myself or what I was worth. I was severely underpaid for, for what it was, <laughs> but I put my whole heart into it and the, the client ended up being a, a really excellent partner. And I had some two great friends, Jordan and Hamza, who were working on social media for that company, Faves, that I first did my ad with. Um, I knew the format I was doing was really going to be really good for ads. Like I knew how naturally and how well I could write creative advertisements for companies inside my videos. And I know I could do it better than anyone else on TikTok. I ended up uh, reaching out to um, the marketing manager at this company that I had seen sponsoring other creators in my space, found her number off a Wix site she had put up in college, texted her. Uh, so just use that classic kind of hustler mentality. And I yeah. just texted her out of the blue and I ended up getting the deal. And my first video performed really well for them. And I saw all these people downloading this app that I was promoting. And I was like, holy shit, like this works. And from there, it was off to the races with – But like sales was the most important thing, like pitching my brand and like pitching the numbers was so key and like really selling it for more than it was. I think that's like just such an excellent skill to have is you really got to pitch what you're doing at a level way beyond what it is. And that's where I was able to get my podcast guests and that's how I was able to get my first brand advertisers. And then, yeah, it turned into turned into to a business and. The timing was great because I first started generating revenue in my first semester, kind of the fall, like a year ago today, um, senior year of high school. And then by the time I graduated, I was looking at employing myself full time and never working in a job or recruiting or anything. Like I'm, I was just back in visiting campus and, you know, you can tell like, you know, like my, my friends think I'm, think it's crazy. Like that, that like I, I, I just work for myself, like that I got lucky with timing, but. I love it. That's the dream, man. Okay, so I, you know what? It's 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 so cool for me as I'm just on this journey as well to just hear the stories that you're telling. Um, so okay, so let's go to the let's go to the consulting side of things. When did that kind of come about? What even sparked that thought? Because that's another kind of mindset shift, right? You spoke about how you kind of have to reinvent yourself. To go from like, I'm just going to make content for myself and maybe I have like a business partner or a content creator who's also on my brand to then being like, I'm actually just going to help other 
brands and content creators scale what they're doing and be more of like almost like an agency or like a consultancy partner what what inspired that up level that shift in thinking um well i decided one day to you know i was making you know i'd made you know some money from from the ads and then i just decided one day to go on a walk to the coffee shop and I listened to My First Million and I heard Sam and Sean talking. I had texted with Sam before, but I'd loved those guys for a while. And they're like, whoever can make us blow up on TikTok is going to get um, $5,000. And I was, the minute I heard them say it, like I shut off the podcast and I just, I had the bias to action. I started working on it. So I don't know. I don't know if it was like because. It was just because I just I knew I could do it better than anyone else. Like I just knew I have what it took and I'm competitive and I wanted to hear them say my name and congratulate me on the win. And I already knew it was over like the minute I heard it. <laughs> and it wasn't yeah. even that I knew I would win. It was that yeah. like I knew I would turn it like I would get the deal to work yeah. with these guys every month to like be paid. It was like I think part of it is like having the mind for like business strategy like, oh, consulting means I don't have to depend on the infrequency potentially of advertising or the lack of performance of those ads screwing my business over every month. But that was probably like, like not even like very psych, like top of mind. It was more just like wanting to do this. And then like it aligned with the greater business strategy, like obviously, but it was more just a bias to action to get shit done and execute. Mm -hmm. And it aligned with the bigger strategy. It's not like I was being, if you're too methodical, you won't succeed. Like if you're trying to map this shit out in a business plan, it's not going to work. You just have to go out and do it. And then like, it'll like, it's probably part of the bigger picture. Like mm -hmm. subconsciously, I knew that building a consulting business would de-risk and mm -hmm. allow me to scale this business and live the lifestyle I wanted and how I could get to the next level. But it was just taking advantage of that opportunity in the moment. Like I didn't know I would go into it. It was just like the opportunity was there and then boom, mm -hmm. right? And that opened another huge set of doors in itself to becoming friends with Sam and Sean. Mm -hmm. Like that's been un, 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 unbelievable. We now manage three podcasts for HubSpot and I just got hired to, to host some content for them on their new YouTube channel. And, um, yeah, I mean that all started like huge deals in the course of a year, all because I decided to, from my college dorm, like just decided to, to, to do their TikTok. And I got really fucking lucky. The first three videos got 2 million views each. And I don't know how. Um, just got extremely, extremely lucky with that too. But it's a mix of a bias to action and then luck. It's like a, a mix of both. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I respect and it's so impressive is you have to prepare for your opportunity. And yes, there was luck involved but you were ready to capitalize. Like you had put yes. the work in, like you were in position. And that's the thing, most people weren't in position. So that's just huge respect on that. Well, I was okay, in position because so I had built those relationships, those connections, and I had the skill set, hmm. right? It's just like, whereas I was in the gym. So when hmm. the fight happened, I was ready to win. Hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. So you, you hear, you're listening to My First Million, you hear them announce the contest. I'm curious, like, what do you do next? Like when you said you, there were two, there were three videos that were like 2 million views. Like yeah. you just took clips from their podcast and reposted it. Like what was the special source that you were adding that did that? Well, <clears throat> it definitely was like the signature, our future, like engaging animations and editing, I'd say was a big part of it. Um, and taking like what we had learned from our, vi our organic video clips and applying that to podcast clips. It hadn't been done before. I hadn't seen other podcasts do that. <clears throat> in these really like informative anima like animations. I think being able to curate the right clips was key and the right stories and be able to say, hey, we think this one's going to go viral or this one won't. I think that was another key skill that you can learn via what we were doing before. Like that was another muscle that was trained in the gym um, in addition to the editing. And like another muscle was just knowing editors so I could call one up and like, let's get to work on this. Um, and I'm also, an, I was in a, I trained as an editor myself. I did all my own editing before I hired a team. I was able to process, build a process out of everything that I was doing. Um, so yeah, that was, um, 
it and then, you know, won the contest. Um, and yeah, it was luck and, and a little bit of the style, but won the contest and then ended up selling the TikTok page back to HubSpot and getting the long-term deal. And it was funny. The reason I got it is because when I was doing the podcast, <clears throat> I emailed Sam to be on my show. He did not come on my show, but he had left his phone number in the signature of his email. So I texted him. He had no idea who I was. I texted him in February of 2020 or some bullshit, March, uh, May of 2020 or whatever. Hey, man, I'm building this media company, like blah, blah, blah. You built the hustle. You're my idol. Blah, blah, blah. He had no idea who I was. Then when the, then the TikTok clip started going viral, I was texting Sam. I was like, yo, look, we're going viral. And then that's how I got on his radar. So then he was a champion for me winning the contest. He started talking about me on MFM. And now that I've been talking about on MFM, a lot of people like in Austin, I'm able to meet them. And it's like, it's literally unbelievable how these, these things octopus out and like all the tentacles and routes. Like it's, it's actually insane. But again, it was all because I was doing the podcast that I was able to be in position to win the contest mm -hmm. because then I had the inside man and that's mm -hmm. unfair advantage. Right. So I think that's funny when I think back on that, me and Sam are great friends now. And that's a relationship that's been invaluable because he opened all the doors for me at HubSpot too. And he's one of those people that looks at a young hustler and says, like, I'm going to like ride with this guy and help him out. And that's what he did for me. And, um, yeah, I ended up getting the deal and then just proving my value to that company. And like, I'm literally living with the guy that got me the deal because there was another agency that was competing for that deal to do the clips for MFM. And I was just like pouring my heart out, like talking passionately about what I had done. But it was more important than that because I had showed what I could do. I grew their page to 40 or 30,000 followers in two weeks. So I had the, I had the proof in the pudding. The, 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 the bit to get to the other end was just that little fire and that bit of confidence and that ability to persuade that got me that deal. And now I'm staying with him for a month here in Austin because uh, uh, we're switching houses. But isn't that wild? And I, now I'm like living with this dude who works at HubSpot who got me that deal. It's like yeah. literally like brought such great things to my life. Like, like we wouldn't be able to live like this if we didn't have our consulting business. Like the ad market took a shit. So I don't know, man. I think, I think it's a lot of luck and a lot of uh, being in the gym. Like that's how I had Sam's number. Like that was another muscle, right? Like cold outreach. Mm. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's so good. And you know, um, when I was listening to the story, the thing, the word that came to my mind was momentum, which is like, you're doing all of these things. And if someone looked at what you were doing, they looked at each action individually, it wouldn't make sense. Like you'd be like, what, why did he do that? And then he did the clips and then he did his own chat. Like it wouldn't make sense, right? But the momentum that you're building, and then it gets to this point where all these like chips that you've been stacking, it comes time for delivery and it's all coming at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And then it's, and, and that's when you start to see those incredible leaps forward in yes. progress. It's like when everything yes. hits. Um, it's like compounding interest, right? Like exponential growth. It's yeah. exponential. Like you just have to take little steps and then it's exponential. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. No, I, I, I love it, man. Okay. So, so you start out doing the, so even when you like initially do the deal with them, that's just to grow the My First Million page. Like how did you mm -hmm. then get the other podcast? That was just through the work you've done in My First Million and proving yourself yeah. in that sense. Proving it, proving myself and then becoming, becoming that guy. Like at first I was like the podcast guy to like people I knew. And then to this company, the goal is to like become that guy for like all things TikTok. And they just started contracting with us in that department because I knew we knew what we were doing. And um, it was more like, yeah, we have that proof of concept. We built goodwill with the manager who was then in charge of like selecting the client for the next show. Then we built goodwill with the second show and now they want us to do a third show and maybe a fourth and a fifth and a sixth when they launched their next podcast. So, you know, um, we did a good job for them. And um, I think, you know, just they loved that, that story, that underdog story. They, you know, they know that Sam fucks with us. Like they know that we went through that process. Like we went through that, that contest. Like it was a pure meritocracy and like we won it out. 
Mm-hmm. And I think it's just a good story that they all vibe with and they know we work hard and we're young cats. We're trying to make it big. So, mm. yeah, Cush- cushioning yourself up to a multi-billion dollar software business is, is if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to get cozy with anybody, I guarantee you get close to some of those money pipes. <laughs> that, that's good shit, man. No, that is, that is so good. Um, okay, sweet. Okay. You know what? I think this is going to be, I hope that like in both of our careers, this is like a, an interview and an episode that people go back to. Um, because this is like really, so the bl- this is really the blueprint of how, of how you get started. Of like how you do something big, like how you do something that other people aren't doing. Um, I'm curious, I think it's always great hearing these stories and you hear about the win and these incredible moments and these unique things that happen. But I know from my experience as well, there's a lot of moments where you're kind of disillusioned along the way. Not everything just works out every time. There's a lot of moments where you're like, you tried really fucking hard and it just didn't work. And you kind of mm. have to be able to go back to the drawing board and show up again the next day. Um, mm. And that's really where people like, that's really where the people that make it separate themselves, that ability to show up the next day. I'm curious, like what were some of those disillusioned moments, those really tough moments where you were like, maybe this isn't even it. Like maybe this isn't even what I'm meant to be doing right now. They've come recently. Um, my ex and I broke up in like last January and that was just really tough because like it was more so that I was like, damn, I'm just working so hard. And like, you know, you're, you're able to like depend on someone like when you're just going all in on your company and like you kind of lose that support system. Um, and, you know, I think that was tough to just deal with that whilst trying to build the business while it was taking off. Um, and then I realized that life isn't all about work, right? Like, I think one of the reasons why, like, you know, like maybe that relationship didn't work out is because I was so focused on building this business. Um, and I was just so obsessed. And, um, you know, at the one point I realized, I was sure, like, is this, is this really how I should be living? Um, building a startup, like all my friends are going to just get stable jobs and like be happy. And then more recently, I've been burnt out as hell on like, this style that I call my own. And, you know, sometimes I get FOMO about what other creators are doing and they're getting more views and views are down and, um, you know, lacking energy and, 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 you know, not really wanting to make more videos and write scripts. And sometimes the thing is, is like, once you build the business out, now it's a game of operation. Like we have product market fit, I, I think my, like me as a business builder over my career is going to be like, get in, start a company, sell it in its early stages. Like, I don't think I'm a long-term operator and I'm even good at that. Um, so now it's more of like, okay, we have a great consulting business that has great product market fit in the market right now. We have a good content business as well, which is proven to work. So we have the, we have the basis for what could be a multi, multi, multi million dollar business. Now it's just process, hiring, culture, and like continued hard work. And I think that the transition between the first and the second stage can be kind of tough. Um, And it it has been a bit bumpy for me to go between the two. Um, And building a team and more people depend on you and you have to show up every day and like, and you have to keep doing Sometimes I feel like a one trick pony sometimes, you know, um, and that I've, I've done this one style and I talk about business in this one way and it's worked, but like, will it work forever? I think those are just some of the questions that I've had to grapple with. Um, but you know, I, I have a really good work life balance right now in Austin, great group of friends. And, um, I've worked hard enough to where I can kind of chill out a bit and, um, reignite that fire and pursue different avenues and just figure out, um, you know, how to produce the best content going forward and how to keep building this business. Hmm. You know, I, I really appreciate that you shared that because, and I've been fighting this myself, which is, I think a lot of the times when you see entrepreneurs, they're so passionate and they have so much belief in what they're doing. You think they're just, they're just confident people. They just do this. And 
there's really a lot of self-doubt that like comes with this whole game. And I'm realizing it myself because I'm starting to double down. Like not only do I want to start produce content for myself, I want to get more into kind of the side that you're in, which is like more of the consulting, like helping other people do it. And yes. like, as you're trying to build it and you're doing outreach and you're getting rejections and you're learning lessons, there's a lot of self doubt of like, man, maybe I should just go out this weekend or maybe like there's, you start to almost question the journey. Like you start to, to question whether you're doing it right. And mm -hmm. I think even Alex Homozi has this quote, which is so much of being an entrepreneur is just outworking your self doubt. Like you, you work it to the point that it's like, you're like, oh, oh no, I was right. Like I, I, I put the work in and I doubled down on what I believed and it worked out in the end. Like you outworked it. Interesting. But that, Interesting. that self, that self doubt is, is always there. And like, I feel it like even when things seem like they're going well, sometimes that will be the moments where you're the most burnt out. And you're like, I don't even really feel, you get to the point of tiredness sometimes, you don't even really feel the win like that. Like something good nope. will happen and you don't even nope, really don't feel, feel that great. Nope. You're just like, you're kind of tired. You're just like, oh, okay, next thing. That's how I felt about some of our wins lately. You get a new deal, get a new contract, whatever. It's like, oh, it's whatever, drop in the bucket. Yeah. It's whatever. All right, cool. It's like, I used to like literally want to go run 10 miles every time a video went viral. That's mm. not around anymore. You know, mm. it's, it's impossible yeah. not to get burnt out, you know, um, you know, what I'm doing to try and like fight it is just uh, trying to have fun. Like, I'm, and, and then refine, rediscover energy, um, mm. through not focusing on it 24 seven, which is what I've been doing for the past two years. So yeah, I know I'm going to yeah. get through it and I know that I'm, I'm working, I'm proactively acknowledging it and, um, today was great. Today, I just, I've been grinding since, since I woke up and it's been awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll the on. only way, th the, the only way forward is through. You can't just mm. sit and stare at the, stare at the ceiling all day. Mm. You know, you just got to do it. You got to write, you got to put words on paper. You just gotta, you gotta work. Mm. No, I love that. And I, it's interesting because I even wrote it in my notes because I was approaching like a similar level of burnout. And I usually get it when I'm in Manhattan because Manhattan has like this relentless hustler's energy to it that you want to keep working even when you're burnt out. Like even when you know you shouldn't, you just want to get at it again. And mm -hmm. I went to, to Jersey for a week and I came back to Manhattan this past weekend and I feel amazing. And so I wrote in my notes, I was like, sometimes you have to zoom out to zoom in which is like, sometimes you just need to change the, the way of operating. You need like a different look. You need yeah. to go somewhere else, try something different. And like, I was just around my family more. I was still working really hard, but I was just in a, in just a kinder environment, like an easier environment. And it just refreshed me. And it's like, zoom out, Couldn't agree more. zoom in, go in again. Yeah. I mean, I was traveling this weekend. I'm traveling this upcoming weekend. Yeah, you got to break the schema. You can't get too ingrained in one form of process. Break it up, change things up, rediscover the passion, get back to work, keep building. So good, rinse, man. repeat. Yeah. Now we we need to we need to chop it up in person sometime cuz this this is one of my favorite episodes for sure and I don't I don't usually say that. So, no, this has been really good. I mean, that means a lot. You're you're a freaking phenomenal interviewer, man. The flow is is excellent. You're so so careful and you know so intentional about the questions that you ask. So, been a time, and I'll have to to come see you when I'm in New York next, which is definitely going to be sometime in the next six months for sure. For sure, let's do it. And I I appreciate that so much, and I appreciate you coming on. Before we before we wrap up, tell everyone where they can find you. Yeah, I mean, follow our future. Um, on YouTube, subscribe. Um, we have two different accounts on TikTok: our future stories, our future bites. Uh, check it out. Instagram: our future HQ. Follow me on Instagram or uh, Twitter Mike, at Michael's Con, M I C H A E L S I K A N D, and uh, be happy to chat and answer any questions you have about short form. And it's been a pleasure to be on the show, Kalen. Yeah, Behind no, the I... thread, baby. <laughs> 
Let's do it. Let's go. All right. It's great to have you on, man.